Mr. Anderson? Present. Mr. Barnett? Here. Mr. Spears? Here. Mr. Waddell? Here. And I am also present. Um, okay. We have a couple of presentations tomorrow evening. And then the, our consent agenda is, of course, the number C1 is approval of the minutes of the agenda briefing meeting on, Mar on uh, January 18th, 2022, and the regular meeting on January 18th, 2022. C2 is a resolution accepting the annual comprehensive financial report for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. C3 is a resolution authorizing the purchase of one used 2019 Caterpillar 320 from Gregory Poole Equipment Company of Charlotte, North Carolina for $132,322.48. Next, we have public hearings. PH1 is an ordinance amending the official zoning map of the City of Wilmington to rezone property located at 6005 Oleander Drive from Office and Institutional District to Community Business District. PH2 is an ordinance amending the official zoning map of the city to rezone property containing 1.05 acres of land located at 6817 Greenville Loop Road from R15 residential to medium density multiple dwelling residential when that's a conditional district to allow for a 10 unit duplex development. PH3 is an ordinance amending the official zoning map of the city to rezone property containing 0.25 acres of land located at 617 South 9th Street from R5 residential to R3 residential conditional district to allow for two single dwelling lots containing two single dwelling homes and two accessory dwelling units. Ordinances 01 is an ordinance making supplemental appropriation in the amount of $575 to the Special Purpose Fund for the River to Sea Bikeway Ride and River to Sea Bikeway Maps. Resolutions R1 is a resolution authorizing the city manager to apply for, a, for staffing for adequate fire and emergency response uh, <coughs> grant in the amount of Two million one hundred and twenty thousand eight hundred and sixty-eight dollars. Tony, could you could you have somebody kind of give us the, the highlights of that? Yes, sir. Tom Robinson's with us this morning. He'll uh, overview the item for you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So the Safer Grant is a three-year grant. It will be valued in the first year at six hundred ninety-five thousand one hundred. Second year, $707,064, and the third year, paying out $718,704. If we were awarded this grant, it would help to subsidize the River Lights Fire Station personnel when we add that for the River Lights Fire Station. That's why we are applying for that grant. Um, and we're hoping that we'll, we'll hear more about that, of course, as we put the application in and everything moves forward with that. I just wanted everybody to hear that. Okay. Thank just, you, Tom. Just, just to remind Council, this. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a reimbursable grant, so we will have to budget the money, and then it will be reimbursed after, uh, if we get the grant, it will be reimbursed after we expend it. And just um, help me understand, I thought I was reading something that said um, you started with a certain number of employees. Do they have to stay with us for three years? And if we lose one, what happens? Um, I'm not sure it gets very specific on employees. We have budgeted for the amount of employees for that fire station. Um, and so it would cover that amount of employees. We would continue to replace those employees anyway if we lose those, so it would continue to cover those. All right. Thank you. I have one. So we're so 12 firefighters is basically what we need to run that, that fire department. We're, yeah, the, we have got 15 in the budget for that because we always hire one in point so many for every position for time off and everything else to do the math right, but yeah. And then the, the the 12 firefighters needed. This this is a basically a ramp up period. This grant would reimburse the city of Wilmington, and then, and we anticipate, you know, with the growth of uh, River Lights, that the tax income there would handle budgeted expenses for the fire department in future years. Yes, and it is in the budget already for those positions. This just will help to supplement that, and the original startup of that fire station as we're under construction, new 
engine and the personnel as well. Thank you. Anybody else with any questions? Anybody else? Great. Thank right. you, sir. Thank you. R2 is a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement with Cape Fear Collective to grant funding to acquire naturally occurring affordable housing utilizing $250,000 of America Rescue Plan Act or ARPA funding. I also have a question. Mr. I was unable to download the, the supporting documents on that. Is Suzanne the person to yes, address sir. that? Could, I just want to know how much of effect $250,000 has on acquiring these type of residences. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Um, the representatives from Cape Fear um, Collective are here as well, so they may be able to shed more light on this than you are, but as um, the, the agreement is that we're supporting um, their overall efforts, they've been acquiring, as you know, with uh, or may know, with other funds, properties. This would allow them to um, take two of uh, probably two, no, maybe three, <laughs> depending, of those units um, and uh, maintain ownership of those as rental units at an affordable rate. So I think the impact would be no more than three given what we're seeing in the market. <clears throat> Mr. Waddell. They'll own them, Cape Fear Collective will own them outright, no debt on these. That's what this 250 will likely go to, towards. For the 250, um, yeah, there would be no debt. Their larger portfolio, of course, we're not involved in. Sure, but that's yes. the intent for the, the yes. 250. But this, this off. would, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, this would serve as a grant. What was so your question, no Luke? So I'm assuming there's, you know, they have financing on many of their properties. So this 250 is going to pay off certain properties. Correct. That's, yeah, that's all. So they're, le I mean, they're they're leveraging the 250, or is that? No, I think they're they're utilizing the 250. If I'm understanding it correctly, to if they have three houses with mortgages on them, they're going to pay off those mortgages for those three homes. Yes. Well, if someone's here from Cape Fear Collective, yeah, if we hear could from if, if we could get Patrick to come forward and thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the 250 uh, and we're going to basically buy out of our current portfolios probably about three properties. Uh, and what that'll allow us to do is our uh, financing is equity financing, so we can recycle the capital. So your 250. If we do it right, should have a 3x or 4x return because we'll take that 250 um, and we'll basically recycle it. And what we're going to try to do with that is buy uh, vacant units and then put them back into the city hop program. So, you know, I can't guarantee you a, a return per se, but I think it'll be somewhere in the, the range of 750000 to a million dollars when it's all said and done. That's what I wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, yeah, I got a question. Yes, Mr. Spears. Uh, Councilman Barnett, do you recall us having a conversation like this? Uh, is he there? He was there. Yes, I'm here. I'm here, sir. Okay. Do you recall us having a conversation like this a couple of, was it last year, year before, something like that? Patrick, is that you? I can't see with the mask on. Uh, yeah, that's me. Okay. Okay. Good. Hello. Um, Hi. So, my... <laughs> I'm still, I'm baffled. I, I I believe it's a good idea, but the ownership, it you know, is it the the ownership is still the issue for me. I think that the idea of it is is good to keep affordable housing. You know, we can't cap rents. We can't we can't do any of that. So this is another measure. This is innovation for us to to try to offset what we're seeing going on in our in our city but still the question of ownership is, is my concern because we can cap these well we can we can <laughs> we can own these dwellings or you can own these dwellings for a period of time but the people who live there will never get to home ownership 
yeah, so I agree with you 100%, Councilman Spears. So our entire intent here is trying to uh, funnel properties into sustainable ownership models, first with the residents or for other individuals. I think for these particular units, what we would do is we contract with several nonprofits around kind of some of the tougher affordable housing. So we would probably target this for like a good shepherd or a family promise where we'd be doing permanent supportive housing and trying to kind of react to that issue area. And then that would free us up capital to do ownership model programming. So we do not want to own property. We don't want to be the business of owning property. We will do so when there is a need around something like permanent supportive housing because it's a very challenging housing to fulfill and there's a strong need for, for um, kind of reaction to, to the homelessness crisis right now. But we do not, we're really all about kind of the ownership and the wealth creation. That's what we're trying to do with our other properties. But these particular ones, uh, we would focus on PSH. So what, it, what okay. I, go ahead, Mr. Spears. No, I was just saying, okay, I, I'm okay. listening to you. Now. Okay, so what I heard you saying, please correct me, is that you're going to take this money and leverage it in such a way that you're going to take some other properties and be able to put them back in the HOP program or the home ownership program, which the, the city has run for many years. Which that, That's correct, ma'am. Okay. S some years back, there was a, a program that uh, over on Frog Pond, over off of... Um, Coval Avenue in that area in Voice of America built homes and or built some apartments mm -hmm. and people went in there and unlike typical uh, Wilmington Housing Authority housing, uh, what was crippling those people, they were paying a portion of their salary mm -hmm. and when they, should they ever get a raise in their salary, their rents went up accordingly. Mm -hmm. And this concept was that they took these people and about once a week or once a month they had credit counseling classes. Mm -hmm. And they would set aside a portion of the rents they were paying to become a down payment. And they were not allowed to stay in there more than five years. And it, it was very successful. It worked. A lot of people became from renters to owners. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's kind of baked into your, to your plan, helping these people get to that point? Yeah, so we have two things we're working on in terms of ownership. The first is access to basically the capital markets to own your home. So the benefit of our financing is that when if we do a lease to own program, which is similar to that, it's all on principle because I'm not running debt, right? So I'm not accruing interest. So we're able to basically put that type of program in place, allow for folks to basically lease to own at a much better rate than they would get otherwise. The other thing that we're looking at, and this is kind of going to be a pilot hopefully in the next 12 months is, we want to be able to kind of have our uh, renting population buy into our portfolio so that a portion of their rent each month actually buys into the equity for what, we're, what we have. So that when they go to cash out, they're able to basically redeem that equity and use that as a down payment. Thank you. So we're looking for some innovative financing models to try to drive the ownership to Councilman Spears' earlier point, because uh, in our mind, that kind of generational wealth creation is the only way that we move forward. Um, so we're looking at some of those. They're just some nuance to it that we're working out. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Will, will there be, and as Councilman Ravenbach just said, will there be um, some wraparound services that these folks will get? Because, again, you know, putting them in a home is great, but what mm -hmm. we want to do is become homeowners, and how do they keep it, and how do they... Mm -hmm. So are there wraparound services? So in these particular, uh, the houses for, these, uh, for this 250000 uh, we would probably do a blanket rental contract with a nonprofit providing those services. So we're real good moving the money around, but those nonprofits are the closest to the action. They know what's best for the residents. Mm -hmm. So like for our Good Shepherd houses, for instance, they, they handle all of the inflow, outflow, the supportive services. Uh, same with Driftwood. They have a case manager on site once we get the renovations complete. So um, for these particular ones, they'll absolutely be that, that in place. For our other uh, residents, we have um, now a resident services manager as well as a renovations manager, uh, as well as a director over the entire operation. So those three individuals plus our community outreach folks engage with them uh, in terms of mm -hmm. everything from first time home buying to connecting them to uh, different types of utility offset services and some other programs in the city and county as well. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any, any other questions? Thank you, appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. R3 is a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement with Genesis Block to, prov to provide small business entrepreneurial opportunities utilizing $100,000 of American Rescue Plan Act funding, ARPA funding.
Any questions? No, they'll be here tomorrow to explain the program, right? They'll, they'll be here tomorrow to go over it? They will be here. We didn't plan on them doing the presentation. Okay. The staff will do the presentation. Yeah. No problem. Thanks. Our but they will, be, they will be there to answer questions tomorrow. Yes, sir. Okay. Because I got so tomorrow. R4 is a resolution authorizing 30, a $35,000 investment by the City of Wilmington in support of the 2022 Isaiah Festival events. Questions, concerns? If not, that concludes our uh, agenda briefing items on our agenda. Mr. City Manager, what's Madam up? Mayor Pro Tem, we have um, Donnie Williams, Chief of Police, who would like to uh, give you the crime statistics presentation that will also be given tomorrow night. We wanted to give it to you twice so you'd have an opportunity to ask questions and interact here, and then tomorrow night he will give it for the, more for the benefit of the public. But if you don't mind, he'd like to go through that presentation. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning. I would like to start off by saying 2021 has been filled with many difficult back-to-back -back challenges. It's important that I thank the men and women of the Wilmington Police Department and their families. They made a lot of sacrifices for this community this past year, and I just want that to be um, known. We also want to thank our partner departments. Some are represented in the room. Many outside organizations that work with us, our mayor, all of you, our city manager, and finally, the citizens that we serve. Next slide. We will start off with our part one crime comparisons. As with past years, we present this in a part one format so we can benchmark. These numbers are preliminary and will have minor changes after they go up to the SBI. In the coming years, we will move this presentation to the NIBRS format and eliminate the part one comparisons. These numbers do not include the following, New Hanover County owned facilities and parks, schools, Novant um, New Hanover facilities, the state ports, Wrightsville Beach satellite annexations, and UNCW properties. And that is important because last year we had some high profile incidents occur in those locations and they are not included in these numbers because they're policed by another police organization. Starting with violent crime, homicides have decreased by six incidents. Rapes increased by 19 incidents. Robberies have decreased by 34 incidents. This is the lowest robbery level since 2009. Aggravated assaults have decreased by 112 incidents. Overall, violent crime has decreased by 133 incidents or 17%. This is the second lowest level over the past 12 years. Last year was our lowest level of violent crime. Getting into property crimes, burglaries have decreased by 106 incidents. This is our lowest level since 2009. Larcenies increased by 285 incidents. This is due to the shoplifting and businesses being closed in 2020 because of the governor's order. And last year, everything opened back up. So we were comparing a year when everything was closed versus a year when everything is open. Motor vehicle thefts increased by 28 incidents. Arsons decreased by 15 incidents. Property crime increased by 192 incidents. And again, the shoplifting's contributed to this. Overall, part one crime increased by 59 incidents. That's a 1.47 cent, 1.47 cent percent increase compared to last year. This is the second lowest level over the past 12 years with last year, 2020, being the lowest. And again, shoplifting was the driver for this. Next slide. Let's talk about our homicides. In 2020, we unfortunately had 22 homicides. Um, this past year, we had 13 homicides with 15 individual victims. Three of these incidents and five of our victims were gang related. One of the incidents was a narcotics deal gone bad. One of the incidents was a robbery that took place downtown. Three of the incidents were domestic violence. Three of the incidents were fatal assaults and two of the incidents were traffic crashes. Any questions at this point so far? Okay. Next slide. 
firearm assaults were a hot, hot button topic, um, and it is nationwide. It's, it, it's increasing tremendously. We thought it was important that we give you a quick snapshot at the city of Wilmington. In 2020, we experienced 134 incidents of gunfire assaults with 248 incidents. In 2021, we experienced 91 incidents of gunfire assault with 150 victims. Comparing 2020 to 2021, incidents decreased by 43 and victims decreased by 98. And all of these um, victims were not injured. There may have been a case where the gun was fired at them and, and, and fortunately the, the person missed and they, they were not hurt. Yes, sir. So when, when I look at this number of victims, it's not saying these persons were shot. We're saying like these persons were shot at? They were shot or they were either shot at. Okay. And so like if per se, somebody came in, in here and, and let's say shot at Luke, would all of us be counted as a victim? <laughs> Potentially, <laughs> yes. Each case is gonna be unique and we have to judge the facts um, relating to each case. Okay. Because I'm, I'm just curious how you get the number of victims. I was, you know, I, I, so it would depend on, okay, it's a scientific kind of thing? How you, how no, you it's just the facts of the, 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 the case. If someone came in here and they said, hey, Luke, I'm particularly going after you, I'm going to shoot Luke. Yeah, Luke's the victim, but if they were just shooting random, and I hate using Luke, and he's sitting right here, and Luke was um, struck, then, of course, we all could be the um, victim in that case. Again, it's going to be based on the circumstances for each case. And these numbers do not include assault by pointing guns. This is just when the weapon is actually discharged. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Shot spotter activations. Shot spotter covers a portion of our city and I wanna thank UNCW for their partnership because they pay for a portion of this. When there is an alert, it is sent to us, UNCW PD, the 911 center and other authorized users. In addition to gunfire, these activations can include fireworks, backfiring vehicles, construction noise, and other noise sources. In 2019, we saw 723 of these activations. In 2020, we saw 1,462 of these activations. And in 2021, we saw 1,409 of these activations. So we actually had a 3% decrease from um, 2020 and two, compared to 2021. Next slide. The vertical numbers on the left side represents the number of crimes in the years are represented at the bottom. During this time period, crime reduced by 2,888 fewer crimes of 41.6%. During this 12 year period, our population increased by 24%. 2021 again was the second lowest year compared to 2020. Next slide. The blue line represents our population and the orange line represents the number of part one crimes. With this slide, we start out with 6,943 part one crimes in the population of 101,438 in 2009. You can see the change in 2021 where we're at less part one crimes and, and again, that population has um, grown and it will continue to grow our population and we're hoping that number will continue to go down. Next slide. The blue line represents the population and the orange line represents the percentage of the population based on the number of part one crimes. In 2009, our population divided by part one crime was 6.84%. Last year, it was 3.22%. It was basically cut in half. Next slide. Our central business district and downtown district. The central business district is the area between the Cape for Memorial Bridge the Holmes Bridge and Third Street and the river. The downtown district covers the same borders except it pushes up to Fifth Avenue. Next slide. In 2020, we saw the fewest part one crimes in years because many of our businesses in nightlife were closed. With things opening in 2021, we saw the increase in larcenies, again, the shopliftings, 56.9%. Crime in the CBD increased from 111 incidents in 2020 to 168 in 2021. There was a murder in the CBD in November, and I'm gonna say this about our officers, they exceeded our expectations. They had that suspect in custody in a matter of minutes, suspects, it was two of them. 
and I am just very proud of those men and women of the Wilmington Police Department and our partner agency with the New Hanover County Sheriff's Office that was out there working our downtown at night. And they were dealing with this when the bars were letting out. So they had a murder going on and they had um, bar closing to contend with. And I was down there with them that night and again, just so, so um, proud of our people. Quick question, Chief. Uh, so that bounced to 168. We're really thinking that's just anomaly because of the uh, everything reopening from 2020 to 2021, the increase in overall larcenies, but we're anticipating that to kind of trail back down to 2019 numbers. Correct. Correct. Makes, makes sense. Thank you. And then another note, there was a question asked at another meeting, and I'm supposed to give you a follow-up. I think it was asked by Council Member Anderson. The new downtown park appears to have had minimal impact on part one crime during its first year of operation. Next slide. The downtown district, which the CBD is included in, saw a 47.7% increase in larcenies. Um, 2021 saw a total of 251 incidents, and again, it's going back to shoplifting. Next slide. Our Wilmington Housing Authority. Last slide. So the increase by going to Fifth Avenue from Third was the difference. Of, I mean, that, that added that many more. It did. Added that much to, the, to the, your area of concern? It did. Okay, thank you. We have a dedicated contract with the Wilmington Housing Authority and Ed McMahon partnered up with um, Ralph Evangelist around 2013, 2014, and um, they contributed some deputies to this cause. Um, when we say Wilmington Housing Authority, we're talking about Creekwood, East Brook, which is located off of Princess Place Drive, Glover Plaza, Hillcrest, Houston Moore, Rankin Terrace, Solomon Towers, Vesta Village, and Woodbridge, which is located off of Grass Lane, which is located off of Barclay Hills Drive. Violent crime in our Wilmington Housing Authority communities decreased by 43%. Property crime in our Housing Authority communities decreased by 33%. And our Wilmington Housing Authority communities saw a 38% reduction in crime. Next slide. Chief, let me ask you a question right there. Okay. Do, could you tell me what has driven down those numbers in public housing? Did, did you, do you have some uh, a partnership with some other organization, uh, the community stepping up? Could you give me an explanation of the decrease in crime in, in public housing? Because we all know the negative connotation that public housing gets when it relates to violence. Sir, I would say a combination of all of the things that um, you talked about, the police department, the sheriff's department, the residents, the housing authority, the city. The, the city um, made an investment in the housing authority with Creekwood through our training um, facility. We placed 16 cameras in the Creekwood community, and that's a promise and a commitment that we made um, to the residents. But it's all of us working together. There's no one entity, there's no one source that can take credit for crime reductions in our communities. And I've heard groups saying that we single-handedly reduced crime. No, they didn't. That is a bold, arrogant statement. It is a we when we talk about crime reduction. It takes all of us in this room. It takes all 125,000. It takes all of our residents working together collectively. Did I answer your question, Thank you, sir? Chief. Yes. Above and beyond. Thank, Thank you. you. This is a new slide that um, we've never put in here before, and I thought it was very important because um, last couple of years there was a lot of focus on the homicides. And at the same time, we have people that are dying in traffic crashes, and the number is growing, it's getting larger. And in 2021, we had 22 people that were killed in traffic crashes in the city. 22 people and two of them were, in, were included in the homicide um, numbers. Six of these crashes were from angle accidents. One was a left turn from the same roadway. One was a bicyclist. Seven were pedestrians. Seven of these crashes were pedestrians. One ran off the road to the right, two ran off the road straight, and four were rearing crashes. In 16 of these 22 crashes, at least one party involved was suspected of using alcohol or drugs. Speed was a factor in six of these um, incidents. 
And some of the things that we're trying to do um, a little bit different, as everybody know, we're stretched thin, but we're hoping to be able to beef up our traffic unit in the future. We have started a PSA um, campaign and we've launched our um, first PSA a few um, weeks ago and our goal is to launch one each month. And we want to try to be more aggressive in enforcing um, traffic violations. But again, it's gonna come down to having the resources and that's why we think education is going to be an important piece of this. We think that the education and the enforcement needs to go hand in hand here. Next, you have a question, sir? Yeah, just clear. What is an angle, an angle crash? Um, a, an example of an angle crash would be um, someone running a stop sign and the two vehicles colliding at an angle. Any other, Mr. Robinson? <laughs> Something that, that I think we all hear about it is um, people speeding through neighborhoods. There, there are some cut through neighborhoods and, and with traffic backed up the way it is, people are seeking, you know, water seeks its lowest level. People are cutting through and we've reduced speed limits to 25. And in a lot of cases, I think it's just a feel good thing that we do to, to help the neighbors by reducing it, but nothing really changes. and. And, and, and it falls on you and your department. And we've had this conversation many times. And with regard to enhancing our enforcement, I know it, it, it takes more people and that takes more money. And that takes more taxes or grants or whatever. Anything that we can do, and I hope that you will, during this upcoming budget season, I hope you will at least let us know what it would take to get to that level where, I mean, because, I mean, Luke and I and, and Clifford just came off through a campaign, and I promise you that was one thing that, that we would hear everywhere we went was the traffic and people abusing the speed limits, um, gridlock at intersections, and nothing apparently can be done except having somebody there to, to write somebody a ticket for blocking the intersection, which creates the gridlock. So uh, what I just said, I hope that you'll do that and not be deterred by anybody above you or, or beside you or whatever telling you not to. I'd like to hear it and just see what it would take to have the kind of traffic enforcement that I think a lot of people out there would applaud. Well, I got to say this about um, my new city manager. We were having a conversation about two months ago, and he basically said what you said to some degree about um, looking at resources that we need. And we're going to be very aggressive with grants in the future. Um, our new grant writer actually started today. And we're, we missed a deadline for this year for the um, state, but next year we wanna be very aggressive in seeking funds for, from the state of North Carolina. And we've worked real hard the past two or three years to develop and cultivate that relationship with the Governor's Highway Safety Program. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barnett. This, when the uh, number of pedestrians that were killed, um, were there any streets that like stand out that, that we need to do something with? Right. Um, I responded to a couple of these myself. I know Shipyard Boulevard was one of the first ones and we've had multiple ones there. And Market Street, we've had multiple ones there. We've had them out on Oleander Drive um, too. Um, people just don't like to use crosswalks and they like to wear dark clothes. Um, one night I almost hit one in my personal vehicle because they were in dark clothes and they were walking in, in the roadway. And okay. I just don't know how we could, how do, how do you fix that? How do you tell people you, you don't wear dark clothes? You would think that's common sense and that you would use the, the crosswalk on a high speed roadway. Okay. And the bulk of the, those three roads that you just mentioned are largely unsidewalked. Uh, I mean, they are, and that's, you know, as we, as we redevelop properties and other people redevelop their properties, they're required, but uh, Market Street, Oleander Drive, and College Road, is, I mean, there's a lot of places along there where there's not a place for them to walk, yeah. and, and I agree with you, they should, they should use the crosswalks, but you know how that works. Thank you. Chief, I just want to say I think everybody up here joins me in saying thank you for your hard work. Hard work pays off. We are awful proud of you and everybody on your force for 
everything you do, the sacrifices people make, and we really appreciate all your effort. Thank you. That means a lot. Thank you. Good job. Mr. Manager, do we have any further business? Madam Mayor Pro Tem, if Tony McEwen, yeah, he's in the back. Tony McEwen has a legislative update for us this morning, and this will be our last item. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Mayor Pro Tem and Council. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to come before you. As, as I like to say whenever I do an update or wrap up, uh, I, I'm blessed to do the job that I have here and, and work on y'all's behalf and the city I love, and I appreciate the opportunity to continue to do it. So thank you. Um, first, let me say, so I'm going to give you a state legislative wrap up from 2021. Um, let me say that the session is not technically over, actually. They have not adjourned for the year for the long session. Uh, they're anticipating some rulings related to redistricting and so they have not again technically adjourned but for all intents and purposes beyond redistricting the the uh, activities that would be impactful to the city of Wilmington are, are all but done um, this has been a really good session for the city uh, in my tenure here uh, I think it's probably been the strongest year that we've ever had uh, and I'm excited to share some of those things with you. Um, we have uh, gained some pretty significant resources. We've stopped a lot, had, had a, a strong hand in stopping a lot of legislative proposals that would be negatively impactful to cities and Wilmington in particular. Um, and then there's a lot of strong policy improvements as well. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be providing you with a high level view of the process and outcomes from this session at the General Assembly. Um, and then talk about um, how much of the focus this year, uh, really a lot of the legislative focus was related to emergency powers, disagreements with the General Assembly and the governor in the budget process as well, and then appropriating federal funds that were flowing through the state. So a little different than, than previous long sessions, there were not a lot of legislative proposals that were coming up that were really impactful to Wilmington or to other cities. So it's a little unique in that regard. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Matt and Dylan. So let me say first off, in addition to thanking y'all for the opportunity, I want to say thank you to our delegation. Every member up there uh, had a part in, in positive outcomes this year. Um, we are very lucky to have the delegation that we do. Um, we are a model for other uh, cities in the state for how we interact with our delegation. Um, Senator Michael Lee, I, I'd like to just give you a couple examples from each of these individuals. Senator Michael Lee, um, you know, is, is very much a force in the state Senate. He's our eyes and ears in the state Senate on, on issues that are important to us. He always has an open line of communication uh, with city officials. Um, you know, some of the, his highlights this year, he introduced a bill uh, during the session and gained some significant co-sponsors that uh, would have added $68 million additional dollars to the state film grant. That ultimately did not pass, but uh, as I'll share with you in a moment, there were some significant improvements as part of the budget process that I know he had a hand in. Um, he was a leader in the indemnification for the Wilmington MPO that will be uh, ultimately some significant cost savings to not only City of Wilmington, but other local governments in the region. Um, and also ran uh, several public safety related bills on our behalf. Uh, our friend Representative Deb Butler, uh, she's been a lead sponsor of legislation hitting back at corporate polluters that release chemicals like PFAS into our air and water and making sure that they pay the bill. Uh, unfortunately, as, as I'm sure y'all would agree, uh, that has not been as successful as maybe what we would like here in Wilmington. Um, but she has, has kept on it. She has been a champion of bike and pedestrian infrastructure funding uh, at the state level. And as I'll touch on in a moment as well, um, she was a leader in stopping one of the uh, main issues that we had this session related to authority around short-term rentals. Uh, Representative Ted Davis, um, his seniority and chairmanship of Judiciary 2 has been very helpful to the city. Uh, he has continued to bring significant resources back to Wilmington and New Hanover County. Uh, he has, uh, as I'll share with you as well in a moment, food bank, opioids, parks, many more things uh, he really delivered for the city and we appreciate his efforts. Um, uh, our, our new friend, Representative Charlie Miller, who hails from Southport and has really just a very small amount, maybe one pre 
precinct of the city of Wilmington, but has southern part of New Hanover County. Uh, he has been extremely impactful in his first year at the General Assembly and has been a very, uh, I think, close friend to, to council in the city um, and has spent a lot more time and attention, I think, with the city of Wilmington than I would have expected. He also, in a very short uh, amount of time, has become a leader uh, on a critical issue for us, which is around flood resilience. One of our biggest advances this session, again, which I'll share with you here in a moment, um, he was one of the original uh, three sponsors of the the biggest bill on this issue along with the majority leader. So he's making a name for himself and we're, we're lucky to have him as an ally and I appreciate Representative Miller. Uh, Senator Rabin, as y'all know, has a small portion of New Hanover County. Um, but is probably one of the five or six most influential uh, political elected officials in this state. Um, he was very helpful, uh, as Mike Kozlowski would attest to, very helpful on the Wilmington indemnification issue and continues to be a leader on transportation issues here in North Carolina. Uh, next slide, please. So those positive relationships and outcomes don't just happen. Um, it's because we, we dig in, in in creative ways, and, and let me show you some of those examples here. On the top left, uh, it's a picture of my laptop uh, when we were immersed uh, um, in, in uh, one of the initial waves of, of COVID. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we still kind of had our legislative breakfast type thing that we used to do uh, when there wasn't an active pandemic, and, and so we, we like to introduce our new legislators to City of Wilmington issues, and so that's us doing a virtual gathering soon after Representative Charlie Miller was gathered. We had multiple members of council present. We had some of our key leaders like Natalie English with the Chamber, Tommy Taylor with the United Way, Wilmington Business Development, the Film Ministry, Aubrey Parsley. So we gave him a good hour briefing of issues that were really important to the city of Wilmington. And so I appreciate y'all's participation in that. We, uh, we spent uh, significant time at the legislature when possible. Um, you know, we do creative things like you see there, our friend Beth Gaglioni at the food bank with Representative Ted Davis. That was, and I know uh, Councilman Barnett, you were there with the mayor that day where we did some significant volunteering uh, at the food bank while talking with Representative Ted Davis about some needs of the food bank and how the city was collaborating with the food bank and what it meant to the community. And that ultimately paid off. And that's the biggest uh, sweet potato at the food bank that day, by the way. And then we even do kind of weird things like convening uh, trash pickups uh, with uh, community organizations like the Plastic Ocean Project and had Representative uh, Deb Butler and Senator Lee come out there and join us and, and literally pick up uh, trash from the side of the road. And after uh, both Senator Lee and Representative Butler, a uh, little funny anecdote from the, that day, after uh, Senator Lee and Representative Butler both spoke and addressed the group and before we went out to volunteering, someone uh, remarked rather loudly from the crowd, who knew it took uh, a litter sweep to bring Republicans and Democrats together? Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's, it's neat that we uh, try to do those things, and, and, and that's something that most cities don't do, and we wouldn't be able to do it were it not for y'all's personal involvement in it and not for the blessing that we get from the city manager to do things a little bit off-color compared to others. And um, unfortunately, Councilman Waddell, you weren't on council when we even did a brewery tour with uh, members of council and our, our legislators, so I'm not sure uh, that brought Republicans and Democrats together as much as the litter suite did, but that's another story. Uh, next slide, please. So here's our long session overview. Um, uh, we finally have a budget, first budget since 2018. And it was pretty clear from the, from the start that the governor and legislative leaders knew that they had to make something happen. Um, I think they negotiated in a much more private and civil manner than they had in the past. Um, and, and ultimately, um, I think the governor probably had a little more influence over the process than he had uh, in, in last, previous years, and that's a credit to both him and to legislative leaders to work in a bipartisan manner. And I think uh, both sides got some things they didn't like, and I think both sides certainly got some things uh, they wanted, and, and it was a win for the state and, and certainly for the city. Um, you know, ironically, North Carolina uh, fared pretty well during COVID with their revenues. And you couple that with the, with the significant relief dollars that were flowing through the state from the federal government um, and the fact that as well, uh, North Carolina was able to save a lot of money because they were only working on reoccurring funds because they didn't pass a budget in previous years. And so it set up a pretty unique situation where the state could be more aggressive than they have in, in, in recent years. And I think that's, uh, again, a credit to our leadership in this state 
state and, and because that's pretty different than what a lot of other states fare, how they fared this year. Um, the American Rescue Plan Act brought $1.3 billion in direct assistance to local governments in North Carolina, but beyond that, $5.5 billion went directly to the state. A lot of that was ultimate, and that's separate from the one3 A lot of that was, was um, uh, funneled down through local governments as well. Um, uh, some of the budget highlights I'll share with you. $25.9 billion for 2021-2022 and $27 billion budget for 22 to 23. Uh, first comprehensive budget, as I said, since 2018. It includes a 5% pay increase for most state employees and 5% pay increase for teachers over the biennium. Uh, $1 billion for broadband expansion. A decrease in the personal income tax rate from 5.25% to 3.99%. By 2027, starting with 4.99% in 2022. One of the biggest focal points in the budget was infrastructure. The budget allotted for roughly $9 billion towards infrastructure, with a considerable amount flowing directly or indirectly to cities and towns. Uh, as far as transportation goes, uh, the, there was full restoration of the state maintenance and assistance program, and the PAL bill funds, which is very important, as you all know, the city of Wilmington was actually increased from previous budget cycles. Uh, and I'm going to touch on in the next slide, a uh, couple slides here, some, some funds that flow directly so, to the city of Wilmington. What, what, do you know, yes, can sir. you, off the top of your head, you know what the increase in the PAL bill funding was? Was it significant or was it just token? I, I'll get that for you okay, very, you. very quickly after this. I, I don't think it was real significant, but it was significant that there was an increase because we'd seen, as decreases. you know, some decreases in recent years. Thank you. Um, so again, some notable items for local governments. Uh, firefighter cancer coverage. As part of the budget, the state established a two-year pilot project for supplemental insurance policy for firefighters diagnosed with cancer. North Carolina, uh, previous to this, was only one of two states without this program in place. The program allots a lump sum of $25,000 for each cancer diagnosis a firefighter receives, up to $50,000 total. It also offers medical cost reimbursement of up to $12,000 for any out-of-pocket medical expenses are incurred annually, including deductibles, co-payments, or co-insurance costs. There are also disability benefits that can last up to 36 months if a firefighter cannot return to work, and they will receive up to 75% of their monthly salary, or $5,000 whichever is less. And yes, sir. Did I understand you say it's a two-year pilot program? Yeah, and I was going to share with you in, in uh, just a moment here a great question. Okay. Um, the assumption is, is this, this is going to go beyond. I think they're using the pilot program format to get a better handle on exactly what the costs are going to be so they can appropriately budget going forward. But everything that I've heard, all the reporting on it, is that this is going to be something that's going to be in place for some time. Thank you, Tony. Yes, sir. Um, Let's see. It, one of the key points on this is this started out as kind of a mixed bag for cities that it was initially proposed as an unfunded mandate for cities. And so I know that this is something very uh, uh, important to the city council, uh, protecting our public safety frontline folks. Um, but again, that, you know, it's a, it puts a different spin on it when it's an unfunded mandate coming from the state. So thankfully, cities were able to work collaboratively with the legislature. And so this is in place, and the state's paying for it like they do in other states. Uh, criminal justice reform. I, I, I couldn't do it justice to get fully into this, but let me just give you some, some basic highlights of it. Uh, I think as, as the city attorney has shared with you in the past, this was a comprehensive bill that would decriminalize certain local ordinances. Um, it would it's implement stronger background checks and mandatory psychological screenings for criminal justice officers. Uh, it uh, changes the procedure for releasing body cam recordings. Uh, it would also create policies, databases, and follow-up plans for law enforcement agencies reporting. Uh, I've worked with Daniel Thurston in the past to make sure he was up to date in real time and could work with uh, law enforcement on these changes. Um, broadband uh, access and funding. The Fiber and C Act, which Council had previously done a resolution in support of, I think going back two or three years now. I know, Mayor Pro Tem, you've been active on that issue. Unfortunately, the wholesale changes that cities have asked for have not been passed yet at the legislature, but they are making positive strides on this. There is, as I said earlier, $1 billion in funding, uh, new funding, uh, put towards broadband access and expansion. Uh, 
however, uh, for the city of Wilmington, positive overall for the state, but as it relates to the city of Wilmington, most of the dollars are rural-based dollars. Uh, you know, that's been kind of the, uh, the pattern for the General Assembly thus far. Uh, affordable housing, uh, always uh, one of the top items on council's agenda. There's an additional $170 million put towards affordable housing this year, and that goes into the Workforce Housing Loan Program as well. They changed that over to a revolving loan fund, which hopefully will grow that uh, pot in the years ahead. One question. Next slide, please. Yes, you, sir. You, you, it's on, your, on your bullet points, it says affordable housing, and then when you tell me about it, it's workforce housing. It's different. Yeah, I think I'm guilty, as most are, of using those terms interchangeably. Um, well, I just wonder if, if, I mean, I wonder what they mean. I mean, because, I mean, there is a difference. I mean, it's, and, it, and I'm guilty of it, too. And yes, I think sir. everybody is. But th there is a difference between affordable housing and workforce housing. No, Sorry. it isn't. Pardon me? Uh -huh. Affor affordable housing is the, the overall bar broad spectrum. Affordable housing is affordable to whoever can afford it. 30% of what you make makes it affordable. So that's a broad spectrum as you look into it. I, I think somewhere along the line it's picked up a, a, an unnecessary term, meaning affordable housing does not mean low income housing. And it, it also does not mean workforce housing. It's just the big umbrella of which all of these other things fall up under. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I take both your points to heart, and I, I appreciate it. Um, uh, next slide, please. So uh, some items, again, specific to Wilmington. Uh, film grant improvements. This is on the heels of previous session where they, thank God, uh, changed uh, the way the film grant uh, was set up to reoccurring, and that was very critical in keeping our film program where it is now in a time of not having active budgets. And so that was something that happened a few years back, thankfully. Uh, what they did this year is made some adjustments to the uh, eligibility requirements, in particular the minimum spends uh, that it will take to qualify for both the, the movie and the TV and the commercial um, uh, applicants. And so that, I think, uh, touches on the attractiveness of North Carolina to what is the, probably the most growth in that industry, which is the streaming service productions. So, uh, and you all know better than I do how well North Carolina is doing, or how well Wilmington and North Carolina are doing uh, with film and entertainment uh, investments being made here locally. Um, historic preservation. Uh, so the, the program has stayed consistent. Where the concern has been is that there had been this looming sunset uh, which was set to expire in 2021. As part of the budget, they actually expanded it to 2030. So the historic uh, uh, tax credit is in place in its current form through 2030. So that's a real positive thing for the city of Wilmington. Uh, search and rescue funds. Uh, our friend, uh, former Chief Buddy Martinet, this has been something that he really led the way on for years and always was a particular item on our council agenda, I, I think, since I've been here. Um, and we had really been a leader convening m many days at the legislature. We brought firefighters in from around the state. And as you know, we host one of the five or, or part of a team that hosts one of the five search and rescue teams around the state. So not only did we get more funding this year, but for the first time we've been working on this effort, we now have reoccurring funding for the search and rescue program to the tune of two million a year. Uh, Representative Ted Davis in particular was very helpful on that issue, but that's something that, that has bipartisan support. It just never for whatever reason happened, but it seems to have finally happened. So uh, Buddy's probably uh, has a drink in his hand smiling somewhere, I think. Next slide, please. All right, so here's some of the proposals that we stopped. Most of these uh, were in the budget, and scarily enough that they passed out of the, uh, they were part of the House and the Senate approved budget. Um, thankfully, in the negotiations process on a lot of these issues, and I'll give you some specific examples, but on a lot of these issues that you see here in front of us, um, we were a part of the effort uh, to make sure that they were taken out of the final budget before the governor signed it. And the first one related to stormwater. 
so uh, the proposal, the, the gist of it was that uh, local governments could not have stormwater regulations that go beyond what the state and federal government had in place. And as Dave Mays, Fred, and Royal, and others uh, who know better than I do would tell you that that's not a whole lot of protection for a community, and it's certainly a one-size-fits-all approach that doesn't necessarily work for a city like Wilmington, where we have different threats than you may have in the Piedmont, as an example, or in the mountains. So uh, we really dug in on this issue. Uh, our communications team, uh, Dave Mays and his team, produced a really good video that we put out on social media. Other communities around the state picked it up and shared it as well. Um, we sent it to several legislators. Um, we set up a direct line of communication where Mayor Saffa was able to talk with Governor Cooper as well to make sure that this was something that was high on his priority list when he entered into final negotiations with legislative leaders. Ultimately, that was stripped out fully. Um, the next issue, short-term rentals. This appeared multiple times, I think at least three different times this session. And uh, if city attorney would like to weigh in with his thoughts on it, he's welcome to. But from a layman's perspective, what I would say is it basically near fully took away a local government's ability to regulate short-term rentals in any meaningful way. Um, this is something that's probably going to continue to come back, and, I, and, and there's some who believe that it was also um, uh, proposed in direct response to our uh, court case that we are actively uh, engaged in. And um, I will say in particular, uh, this would come up in committee, and there really was not a lot of voice of opposition. Um, Representative Deb Butler, to her credit, reached out to us, uh, Meredith Everhart in, in the city attorney's office, and I worked with her on some talking points. She was already very familiar with the issue, living in, in our downtown community, but we provided her some talking points, and she really led the charge uh, in the General Assembly. And, and certainly she's in the minority, and so at times, uh, you know, members of the minority party, their, their power can be a bit limited, um, but she did everything she could within her power. And I know that because we would get calls from the Metro mayors and the League of Municipalities thanking us and having us thank Representative Butler for how much she dug in. So when folks were silent on this, she was the one that really lent a voice to this. Then when it got to the House floor, uh, Representative Charlie Miller and Repres Representative Ted Davis were literally the only two Republicans in the entire General Assembly to vote against it. And it passed the House. Uh, it kind of got bogged down in the Senate, and then it materialized again in the budget. And again, it was in the budget that passed the House and the Senate. But ultimately, in final negotiations, this was yet another thing that got pulled out. I anticipate that we'll see it again. But again, this is a, a prime example, thanks to council and thanks to staff, that Wilmington really, there's no other way to say it, really led the way in making sure that this thing stopped in its tracks. And, uh, and so every member of our delegation played a role in this, and uh, I just want to say thank you to them. Um, next item is the tree ordinance issue. I'm sorry, uh, same slide, but next item. Uh, I said that a little too excitedly, I think. Uh, tree ordinances. Um, there was an item in the budget. This was rumored that this was going to take place, but there was an item in the budget that said uh, would have eliminated local tree ordinances and only allow local tree removal and protection rules uh, if passed as a part of a local act. Now, the city of Wilmington and New Hanover County would have been grandfathered into this uh, because we did have an existing local act and it wouldn't have, have, have taken those away. But obviously this is something I know that city council and, and, and uh, the community feel strongly about. And, uh, and so this was yet another item that was taken out as well. Um, the school zoning preemption. This would have allowed the siting of schools in any residential or commercially zoned area of a city without consideration of appropriateness or infrastructure. That was in the, both the House and Senate approved budget, and it was taken out as part of final negotiations. And then as, throughout the year, but in particular as part of the budget, there were multiple sales tax exemptions that were proposed and would have had certainly a negative revenue, uh, not speaking to the value of any of them, but it would have had a negative revenue impact uh, on cities, on local governments in general. Um, those, I, I think there was a couple minor things related to builder, builder's inventory that um, ultimately passed, but in general there was, there, there was very little that passed in the way of revenue impacts. Yes, sir. When you, on these uh, five items right here, when they were, they were both got passed, they passed muster in the House and the Senate. Yes, sir. And then during the, I'm, I'm certainly not familiar with the way that body operates was there 
something taken back, something given? I mean, was the fine art a negotiation, or they just were erased out of the budget and they will be back? Well, I, I think this was a part of, you know, I, I think there's a, well, first off, to go to the process question. You know, the, the, this year, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, the House had the first crack at the budget. That ch it changes every biennium. House got to propose the budget first out the gate. Then it goes over to the Senate, and then there's a negotiation between the two. There's typically a conference committee to iron out the differences. And from there, it then goes to the governor. And the governor has the ability to sign, let it go into law without a signature or veto it. And obviously, um, uh, he didn't veto it this year. Uh, but there was months-long negotiation in the process. And it went well deep into the fall, where typically they would pass something in July or August at, at, at the latest. And um, I, I think there was likely maybe some horse trading in it. You know, I think there's something to be said for legislative leaders, and this is whether it be Democrat or Republican put items into the budget knowing that that's going to be a part of the negotiation and they may not be fully married to it in the long run, and that could have been the case with any of these items. Does that, does that help? Okay, clearer. Attorney, <laughs> yes, can sir. I, can I hear from the city attorney on the short-term rentals piece, both on where, what the actual language was with the, the proposed legislation at the state level and where it stands? Sure, without getting into too much of our active litigation that's going on or uh, getting into too much history, uh, bottom line is there was debate over whether uh, cities were precluded from including a registration. Um, that comes from a completely different um, chapter, uh, different part. Uh, the fact that there was a recodification of all the land use and zoning law um, complicated matters further. Um, the recodification 160D said that it was simply clarifying existing law, and it did insert, I believe it is seven words that the folks who wrote it felt made, made it clear that the registration prohibition did not apply in a zoning short-term rental context. Um, that became an extremely big bone of contention. In our own case, the trial judge actually found that those seven words didn't clarify it and that we were precluded from doing so. Um, our case is in front of the Court of Appeals right now. We've already argued it. Frankly, we're waiting on a decision. The panel was extremely cognizant of the fact that these um, bills were in the legislature, asked several questions about them, and essentially what that bill would do would delete the seven words that clarified it, but which clearly didn't make it clearly or clear enough uh, for the court's satisfaction. Um, where we stand right now is we're simply waiting on the Court of Appeals. It would certainly be a lot of speculation to uh, see where this will go. I will say that once we get that ruling back, the possibility of there being an appeal is certainly there, and the possibility of further uh, legislation about it is certainly there. Right now, I think it's a toss-up of where the law lands eventually. Are we kind of in a holding pattern now, waiting for the, the Court of Appeals decision? Uh, yes, sir. The, uh, the holding pattern is a stay of the ruling below was issued that's a long way of saying the ordinance is still valid, the ordinance is still enforceable. We are still, and Council Member Waddell, I, you may not have this history, we still are keeping our money saved just in case um, it turns out to not go in our favor. So we, we're careful, uh, Council instructed us to do that, and we are. But bottom line is the ordinance is still enforceable, and we're just waiting for a decision to see where it goes in the future. And we are enforcing it as we move along. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, John. Uh, next slide, please. So here comes uh, some fun stuff as well. Like I said, in general, it was a good year for us uh, at the city. It was a good year for, I mean, um, at the legislature. It was a good year for cities in general at the legislature. Uh, and they did good work. Uh, we did everything we could 
uh, to kind of step on the gas and, and, and bring back some deliverables for the community. Um, and so here's some examples of those. Uh, I know uh, council is aware uh, of our opioid overdose quick response team. The initial funding that we got from that uh, came from a $500,000 appropriation from Representative Ted Davis. And the basic budget is about $250,000 a year uh, to do a, a, a full-scale program. It's been highly, highly successful, as, as we've reported many times. Well, we, um, there was a lull in the state funding. We kind of had a, a, a council invested, United Way invested, and the county invested to keep it going for a few months. Representative Ted Davis, we went back to him. He promised that he would work on it, and, and as always, Representative Ted Davis delivered. And frankly, he delivered beyond what we even had thought he would. Uh, we got $750,000 to keep the program going uh, with state funds. Um, we are actively working with legislative staff, um, um, uh, Department of Public Safety staff, to see whether or not we can extend this to three years or whether or not this is a two-year program with these $750,000 where we can kind of bolster the program beyond what it was with marketing and, and uh, additional staff and that type of thing. So. Thanks to Representative Ted Davis and others for that. Uh, we have, uh, we're able to get $250,000 for additional study related to rail realignment. Uh, Aubrey and pa Parsley and I worked with Senator Lee on that issue. Uh, there is a $250,000 for use for uh, kind of general infrastructure uh, that we also got. Uh, I think you'd credit all of our legislators, in particular Senator Lee on that one. Um, the Wilmington MPO indemnification, as I mentioned previously, uh, I'm not even sure what the price tag is that you would associate with that, but I know it's going to be a major savings. And then last on the list, uh, as I referenced earlier, uh, Representative Ted Davis and both Representative Miller partnered to uh, get $750,000 for the food bank as part of their capital program that, that council has already uh, partner with them on. Um, uh, I worked with Beth and her team uh, to bring legislators in and, and start to expose them to what the project would mean to not only the city, but to the region. Um, so those are all positive things. We, we've got a, a couple other notable projects. I'll just uh, mention to you that we're not, certainly the city of Wilmington did not initiate these, but nonetheless are, are worth mentioning. Uh, there's a, a Randall Library renovation uh, and expansion, $56 million was in the budget for that. Uh, $10 million for renovations at the Center uh, for Marine Studies, UNCW Center for Marine Studies, and $283.8 million uh, for Wilmington Harbor Enhancement. I think you all probably saw that in the media a few months back. But the, the, UNCW in particular, um, I know they work with Senator Rabin, Senator Lee, and others. Uh, there's, there's almost too many items to mention that, uh, that they received. I know there were significant needs, uh, but they did really well in the budget, and I know that's going to improve an already great school. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another thing I'd like to share that, that uh, I'm really proud of and, and the city uh, should be really proud of is, you know, I've, I've talked with you on the past about our Eastern North Carolina Re Recovery and Resilience Alliance uh, that Mayor Sappho and uh, Pender County Chairman George Brown, uh, now Commissioner Jackie Newton, kind of co-lead and we have, uh, I believe at last check, 64 mayors and county commission chairs that are members of the organization now. Since Florence, we have continued to grow this, um, and we've continued to ask the legislature for certain investments and policy changes, and that seemed to all come full circle this year. Um, and uh, you see this is our most recent meeting we had on December 8th uh, in Goldsboro. We had over 50 different communities represented. Those are counties and cities, towns as small as Garland, uh, counties as big as Cumberland County, all came in. And we went through, with the help of folks much smarter than myself, um, uh, went through all the achievements that we got in the budget. And so what we had done with our alliance, um, we had set up basically a virtual listening tour uh, that I organized on behalf of, of the city. And we had folks like the Environmental Defense Fund, Pew Charitable Trust, American Flood Coalition that provided kind of some policy chops behind it. And so we did this virtual listening tour where we, we were hearing from mayors and county commissioners and council members throughout eastern North Carolina about what their needs are around resilience. And we came up with six priorities. 
And ultimately, uh, every one of those priorities were um, adopted as part of uh, House Bill 500. And again, I, this is a little bit old news. I know I've mentioned this to you in the past, but bear with me. Um, so that was led by uh, the House Majority Leader John Bell, who's a UNCW graduate, represents the Goldsboro area, um, and is a really uh, definite, powerful figure in the General Assembly and works hard. Uh, and then Representative Charlie Miller, as I said, was one of the original three sponsors of the bill. Well, that didn't, a lot of times spending appropriations related bills aren't intended to advance as part of the typical legislative process. They're intended to ultimately be a show of support and get put into the budget. Well, this did, in five of our six priorities that, that we asked for, in addition to a lot of other things, were ultimately passed as part of the budget. There was $347 million, that's the estimate, uh, put into recovery and resiliency that was not there previously. And so let me kind of give you an example of what that means for us. Next slide, if you don't mind. So this is kind of how our five of six items played out. So a statewide blueprint, and I'm sorry, I've got that um, a typo in there. It's actually 20 million. Um, some of the key outputs with that, that will be a statewide assessment with flood risk. It will identify data gaps that, that are, are, are missing. It will show how to reduce flood risk around the state. Uh, it's a decision tool for investments and strategies. So it kind of follows this model that, that other successful states like Iowa and Louisiana have utilized to make kind of wholesale smart uh, changes uh, when it relates to recovery and resilience. There was 15 million for transport, tra transportation infrastructure resilience funding. Uh, so that's a new grant program for local governments and nonprofits to update transportation infrastructure, uh, identify risk assessments for critical routes like I-95 and I-40, uh, as well as community informed uh, risk assessments that can be shared with local governments. Uh, 134 million new dollars uh, for stream management. If you talk to the folks in Columbus and Duplin counties and places like that, that's the that's the tip of the spear for their needs, um, and that's where their biggest request is is uh, those dollars. Um, and so that will go to the removal and disposal of debris from waters of the state. The targeted basins, one of the four, is the Cape Fear River Basin. Um, uh, innovative flood resilience grants, $55 million. Again, that's something that, that is eligible for nonprofits and local governments to apply for. And then one of the probably the really unique thing, it's, it's not a big ticket item relative to some of these other things, but technical assistance. What we kept hearing over and over is that, um, well, yeah, if you're a community like Fair Bluff that unfortunately was almost wiped off the face of the earth from floods, that uh, there's all these dollars coming down, but they're not necessarily prepared from a technical assistance perspective to access these dollars, not only to find where the dollars are, to apply for them, but how to do the engineering and implement these programs. And so that was a direct ask we made, and ultimately there were $6 million appropriated that will probably most likely go to the council, well, it is going to the council of governments to create positions to work year-round on the ground in, in regions throughout the state. Uh, there will be multiple ones in eastern North Carolina so that they'll be working with these local governments to help them find the funds, apply for the funds, and understand how to utilize them. So that's a smaller dollar amount, but a big deal. Uh, and again, I appreciate uh, council uh, and city manager allowing us to kind of work in a, in a unique way and build up this coalition. It takes a lot of time, but uh, as you see, there's a lot of positive outcomes. And you know, really one of those things that you can't measure but I think is almost as important as some of these dollars and policy improvements is the fact that we can be seen and the city of Wilmington is partnering with our rural communities. And so some of the legislatures, legislators from Columbus County, Robinson County, Bladen County, wherever, uh, see that we're being a leader on behalf of their communities. We're assisting them. And it's, it's a positive thing for us and it's a positive thing for our influence at the legislature going forward. Uh, and that's the last slide. I, you know, I'll come back to you with um, some of the updates on redistricting thus far. You know, it's, as you likely know, it's, it's in the state Supreme Court's hands at this point. Some of the proposals that, that uh, we saw previously, there were not significant changes um, uh, to our maps. I think there's a possibility you may see um, uh, Senator Rabin no longer have any precincts in New Hanover County. Uh, that's some of what I've seen, but who knows what the final outcome on this is going to be. And that's all I have. Thank you, Tony. I think we've got a couple of questions here. Mr. Anderson. Tony, um, and this may, I never, it's one of these things that doesn't get covered, maybe too, too minutia for, certainly for this report, but I know with a lot of this PPP loans that was there much discussion. I know the state, I mean, the, 
how they're going to be treated in terms of um, income? Because as I understand it, you know, and talking to several accountants, they're like, we have no, you know, no way that they haven't done anything. Whereas most states have fought or followed the federal government's treating it mm -hmm. as a, you know, forget if it gets forgiven, it, it's forgiven. It's not something you pay taxes on. But the states just kind of dragging their feet. If you, if, is there any? I mean, but I haven't checked. You know, some accountant in my ear. <laughs> you know, back in April. But uh, right now, I mean, it, do you know anything more about that? I, I do not. I, I don't know if our finance chair, deputy manager, she she doesn't either. Um, I, I'll, I'll see if I can find out. It's easy. Uh, it's easy as just calling, uh, you know, Senator Lee or something. I just thought you might know. But. Yeah. Let, let me see what I can find out, and I'll, I'll get something to you quickly, sir. Thank. You. Any other questions? Tony, thank you. We appreciate your bipartisan approach to serving the city. It's, it's great. You've obviously had a lot of success from hard work. Yeah, I, I appreciate it, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Caudill, do we have any further business? We have no, we have no further presentations, but appointments committee does meet after this meeting downstairs. Yes, thank you. With no further business, we stand adjourned.